It's David Attenborough on a personal journey back before the dinosaurs. Natural World here on BBC Two in half an hour. There are almost 200 official countries in the world today, but there are dozens more breakaway states, determined to be separate, but officially not recognised. Some survive peacefully with their own borders, money and presidents, but others are a magnet for terrorists and weapon smuggling and have armies ready for a fight. Welcome to places that don't exist. Moldova, sandwiched between Romania and Ukraine, gained independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Two-thirds of the people were of Romanian descent and wanted closer ties with neighbours to the west. But the eastern side of the country wanted to retain close links with Ukraine and Russia. War broke out and the east split to form Transnistria, a new country which even now remains unrecognised by the rest of the world. My journey began in Chisinau, the capital of Moldova, where I visited a Civil War memorial with my guide Liliana. This is a monument to the glory of those who died for the independence and the integrity of the country. Presumably these are all Moldovan soldiers rather than Transnistrian as well. These are definitely those who fought on the Moldovan side. So what actually happened in the war? Transnistrian separatists attacked Moldova. They were afraid that Moldova is moving closer to the European Union and Romania, first of all. Russia backed up Transnistrian separatists. The fight stopped after the intervention of the Russian president at that time, Boris Yeltsin. It, it's been an uneasy ceasefire. It's kind of like a cold war that is still lasting between those two sides. <laughs> I arrived in Moldova on Independence Day. Vladimir Voronin, the president of Moldova, was leading a service to commemorate those who died during the fighting with Transnistria. Around 1,500 people were killed on both sides in the war, but the rest of the world barely noticed. Although it's Independence Day in Moldova, they don't actually celebrate this in Transnistria, although officially, obviously, they're one country. In Transnistria, they have their own Independence Day in a few days' time. But not everyone was celebrating independence. What was she singing? She was singing Shraka Strana Maya Radnaya, which means uh, great and wide and large is my country. She was, it was a song about Russia. It's quite provocative to sing this kind of song on the Independence Day of Moldova. And this independence is seen, first of all, as independence from Russia. <laughs> the woman was taken away by the police. Most people in Moldova earn less than two pounds a day. The conflict with Transnistria hasn't helped. Away from the towns, work is scarce and unemployment is high. We're not going to make it out there, are we? When you get outside the capital of Moldova, you realise this is actually a very poor country. And officially, it's supposed to be the poorest country in Europe. And we've come to this village in the southwest of the country where we've been told that villagers have come up with a rather extreme method of earning some extra cash. Simon. <laughs> 
32 men in this village have sold one of their kidneys to Westerners desperate for a transplant. Most were paid no more than £2,000. Do you know what happened to your kidney? Do you know who received it? It went to a woman around 40. I saw her. She was preparing for the transplant. Did she speak to you? Did you have any conversation with her? Or... I never spoke to her. She had been given the anaesthetic, so she was unconscious. What did you do with the money? First I bought a cow, then I renovated the house. I bought a washing machine and clothes for the kids. That was it, it was all gone. In many Moldovan villages, only children and grandparents remain. Young adults have gone abroad in search of work. The little one here hasn't seen her mother for five months. Her mother's gone to Moscow, so she can't get a job here, so she's gone to Russia to earn some money. Around a million Moldovans are thought to have left the country. We'd been invited to meet the president at his official villa. On our way, Liliana explained why Transnistria matters to him. For President Voronin, this is a personal issue because he's born there. His mother lives in Transnistria, and for Voronin, that's also a personal matter. Especially that for the past two years, uh, he hasn't been allowed at all to, to, to go there, to travel, to cross the river and see his mother. So, yes, it is a very important issue for President Voronin. If I'm not surprised, that's the president in his jeans. Let's go and say hello. It has very, very, very oh. nice spots. Did he say that it had spots like um, President Gorbachev? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a true communist cat. The cynical side of me thinks he's replaced here. It's so easy, what a lovely chap he is. Do you want us to carry you? I'll go this way. Eliana has got her high heels. Because like me, she thought we'd be in an office having a chat. So we all got dressed up, which we now transpires was a bit of a mistake. Look at those, look at those. The president had decided to take us fishing. Wow. Why should the rest of the world be worried about the Transnistrian situation. What's going on there that the rest of Europe should be concerned about? Moldova has a 480 kilometer border with the Ukraine and the section in Transnistria is not controlled. And via this there's uncontrolled migration, contraband, arms trafficking, the trafficking of human beings and drugs. These operations are being legitimized by the separatist regime. It's a black hole of corruption and trafficking. There are 13 enterprises in Transnistria that are producing arms non-stop. The president cut short his allegations because he'd caught a fish. The president then insisted we celebrate national independence with a glass or two of fine Moldovan cognac. It's very hard to refuse the president when they offer you cognac and we have to get through the entire bottle. This is not about alcohol or getting drunk. I'm very proud of Moldovan cognac and I want to promote it. I totally approve of this. The fact that you have not considered is my complete inability to drink alcohol. By the time the first lady returned from shopping, we were finishing the second bottle. <laughs> That night, the whole of Kizinau seemed to be celebrating at a huge independence party. It's 
tough job, what can I say? We left Liliana to drive to what is still officially part of Moldova, even if the Moldovan president can't come here. We're just coming up to the border between Transnistria and Moldova now. At the moment, we're in the what is essentially a demilitarized zone between Moldova and Transnistria. Just before we arrived, Transnistria banned the teaching of Moldovan in their schools, allowing only Russian. Moldova responded with an economic blockade. Can we film yet? Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we, can, film. we can film. Hello. Nice to meet you. At the border, I met Larissa, who would be my guide in Transnistria. It was very interesting to meet you here <laughs> and to see your reaction to everything. <laughs> and now, are we on? Are we in Transnistria now? I believe yes. This is in the territory of Transnistria now. We just wanted to film our arrival in Transnistria, but the border guards have come over in a very Soviet way and tried to take the camera away and stop us, but now we're having a little bit of a, a discussion with them, a healthy discussion about the fact that we are already registered, it's already perfectly legitimate for us to be here. We passed through customs and border posts, crossed the river dividing the two countries, and were allowed into Transnistria. A short drive took us to Tiraspol, the capital, where Soviet-era statues are still standing. It is quite rare to see statues of Lenin still standing. Do people look back fondly on the Soviet times? No, you know, just we do not carry out war with monuments. So you choose not to destroy them? Uh, it was made uh, by a good um, sculpture. It is made of a good material. It expresses something. Let it stay. So it's quite a small bed, but in this hotel, apparently there's only one double room, and that's been booked up by the customs committee, whatever that is. <laughs> the only other problem we've been told with this hotel and other hotels like it is that we will be watched and we will be listened to, so I suspect, based on what we're told, that the rooms are bugged by the Transnistrian KGB, who are really just operating as if it was still Soviet times. There's certainly a Soviet heir to Tiraspol, but there were none of the armed men Moldovans had told us we'd see loitering around the streets. For you, Soviet is something bad. And for us, Soviet is a good word. It was the time of a very good and stable life. But it doesn't mean that the life is the same as it was in the times of the Soviet Union. It's quite different. We are uh, realistic people, and we understand that everything has changed. We have our passports. <laughs> so this is a Transnistrian passport? Yes. Who recognizes this passport? We do. Does, does anybody else? No. <laughs> We've just been accosted by an official from the Transnistrian Bank who wants us to come to an exhibition they're having here for the 10th anniversary of the Transnistrian ruble. See, the rest of the world might not think this place exists, but they have their own stamps, their own government, their own president, and their own money. Printing money is one of the major steps for a breakaway state trying to secure independence. The Moldovan government was furious when Transnistrians began issuing their own currency. So why are there no pictures of the president on your notes? We don't have a cult of personality of the president here. The history of our republic is very short. We don't have many modern heroes. That's why the banknotes have portraits of the people who've influenced our development. This is a huge steelworks and metal factory, one of the largest in the former Soviet Union that used to export all over the former Soviet Union in the, in the old days during the Cold War. Now, obviously, it's part of Transnistria. 
There's a lot of rumours that they're producing arms here in secret factories. Absolutely huge. I don't think I've ever been anywhere quite so vast, such a vast industrial plant. I mean, they could be hiding any number of arms factories here and we would never be able to see them. People in Moldova often like to claim that Transnistria can't function as a, as a full state, it doesn't have the necessary industry or infrastructure. When you come here, you actually realize that it clearly does have massive economy massive number of factories and in fact some people here have suggested to us that it's Moldova that can't function as a state and Transnistria will be the one that survives. During Soviet times most of the heavy industry in Moldova was concentrated in Transnistria. When the territory proclaimed independence it kept the biggest most productive factories. But buyers abroad don't recognize Transnistria exists and after the blockade imposed by Moldova Factories are stockpiling goods and laying off workers. Actually, on this one, you can see the country of destination is supposed to be the United Kingdom. And they can't send it because of the blockade. But also, interestingly, it has made in Moldova. The action Moldova is taking against Transnistria is economic war. Transnistria has survived for 14 years without support from Moldova or the rest of the world. It has everything it needs to survive whether Moldova likes it or not. Another thing that people outside Transnistria have said to us is that this factory is one of several producing armaments, producing weapons. We haven't got time. We've got no time to produce weapons. Just steal. Transnistria is thought to be a major producer of arms, and guns from here have turned up in Chechnya and Africa. But nobody really knows what's going on. International organizations don't recognize Transnistria exists, so they're not able to visit and investigate. Transnistria shares a border with the Ukraine, and it's notoriously porous. There's all sorts of goods being smuggled across from cigarettes and alcohol through to quite serious weapons that are being produced in Transnistria away from the prying eyes of the international community. And to give you an idea of just how easy it is to smuggle in this region, where I'm standing now is in Transnistria and this road here takes you further into Transnistria. But if we cross over here to these fields and where I'm standing now, we're actually in the Ukraine. So we just crossed the border illegally, but there's no guards or border posts to stop us. There's not even a line indicating we're on a border, an international border between two countries. And this is what smugglers do. They'll come down here in a car or a van, and they can get into the Ukraine on well-worn tracks like this one in front of us here. And when they're in the Ukraine, they can get to the Black Sea port of Odessa. And from there, they can ship goods and weapons to the rest of the world. It's not just at the unofficial border crossings that goods are being smuggled across. They're also being smuggled across official crossings like the one down there. The Transnistrian and the Ukrainian Customs Authority, which is on the other side, are both notoriously corrupt. There's always goods being passed back and forth with the tacit agreement of some customs officials. And the Transnistrian Customs Authority is actually controlled by the president's son. The president's son is also alleged to be involved with a company called Sheriff, which Interpol has claimed is linked to arms trafficking. The firm has just built a multi-million pound football stadium where Moldova, who have no such stadiums, play their international games. Impressive ground. We're preparing for the World Cup game against Italy. When the president of FIFA, Sepp Blatter, saw this, he said... Wonderful, beautiful... <laughs> Apart from this stadium, Sheriff also owns supermarkets, petrol stations and a mobile phone network. Some people refer to Transnistria as the Republic of Sheriff. 
So it's called sheriff because the two men who started it both used to be Soviet police officers. Yes, and also because almost all of the people who work for the club are members of the police force or were officers in the Russian or Soviet army. I was a colonel in the Russian army before I resigned. Two days later, the Moldovans announced their upcoming match against Italy would in fact be played in Moldova's crumbling stadium rather than give Transnistria any publicity. Moldova lost 1-0. I just came round the front of the building because uh, we've been told there's a Mercedes showroom, of all things, uh, in the front of the stadium complex. Again, Mercedes cars are being sold in the country where people are earning peanuts for wages. It's a little odd, but like everywhere in the former Soviet Union, some people earn a lot of money and most people earn next to nothing. How much does this cost? Uh, 16000 dollars. So this is sixty thousand dollars to buy. So that's about forty thousand British pounds. Whew. We have it on credit. What yes if can say Vashava film uh Premier Minister Vilika Britannia Gaspadin Blair? If, as a result of your film, the British Prime Minister officially recognizes the existence of the Transnistrian Republic, then you'll receive this car as a gift. This car as a gift? Yeah. Right. Have I got Downey Street's number? I'm just going to look for my telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get him on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Huge crowds came out to celebrate Transnistrian Independence Day. Although the population of Transnistria is only around 600,000, its forces match those of Moldova, leading to military stalemate between the two. <laughs> Igor Smirnov, the Transnistrian president, was taking the salute. I think this has the most Soviet feel to anywhere I've ever been. The marching, the soldiers, the emblems, and particularly the music. It just strikes me that we're, we're in Moscow 20 years ago. It's quite incredible. It's a complete throwback. say hello to the president and ask him a few questions. Mr. President, can we just ask, what does Independence Day mean to you and does it disappoint you that the rest of the world is not here to celebrate with you? I'm not at all disappointed. We have to create well-being by ourselves. We're happy to receive guests from all over the world. We don't want to ask them for anything. We'd like to learn something from them. Independence means protecting all the generations who live here, regardless of their nationality. Moldovans, Ukrainians, Russians. I don't want to list every one. There are 46 in all. That's actually the foreign minister from Abkhazia, which is a breakaway state in Georgia. So although representatives from the European Union or America aren't attending these celebrations in Transnistria, representatives of breakaway states are here. They're the only ones who will really recognize Transnistria's independence. But they don't count because nobody recognizes them either. <laughs> the celebrations went on all day. Transnistrians seem completely committed to their independence. Nobody I met wanted reunification with Moldova.
What is this called? Latinda. Latinda. Yes, it's, right. called, it's na the National Moldavian dish. You eat this here in Transnistria even though it's Moldovan? You know, some people hate Japanese, but they eat sushi. <laughs> Celebrations today started with a quite traditional, almost Soviet feel, but they're ending with a huge party, fireworks, and Russian pop stars who've been flown in especially for a great big party for everyone. Transnistrian Independence Day today. Most of the headline acts at this concert tonight are all Russian. While Moldova tends to look to the West for inspiration to Europe, this country definitely looks to the East. The Russian army still provides security for Transnistria and has a secret military base in the north of the country. The base is believed to contain an ammunition stockpile, which Western intelligence experts fear is already falling into the wrong hands and could reach terrorist groups. Obviously, we would have liked to get a little bit closer to this base, but the Russians said that we couldn't visit them. And every road we go down, trying to get closer, we find there's a, a military blockade. So we're going to have to creep through the bushes a little bit and even then we're going to be a fair old distance away. But it does feel a bit strange doing this, actually. I mean, 15 years ago, this was still part of the Soviet Union, and uh, we'd be Westerners creeping towards a secret military base. Now, if we get caught, we'll probably just be told off or arrested or held for a while. But then we'd have probably been tried as spies. So the base... I think we can see the, we can see the outline of the... Oh, there's a car going past. <laughs> oh, God. A car just went past and saw us and slowed down just as I was going like that. Oh, well. If we get caught, we get caught. I mean, we'll have to make up some story about making a film about the beautiful Transnistrian countryside, taking the country air, looking at the lovely trees, the secret Russian military base. Oh, is it really? Oh, I had no idea. A policeman and a soldier have turned up. Well, we might be arrested, we're not sure. We thought we were a fairly safe distance away from the Russian base. The policeman's taken our identification papers and our accreditation, passports, the lot. They were very, very fast. I mean, we're a good, oh, I don't know, mile, kilometre from the, from the base. The Transnistrian KGB soon turned up. We were detained as spies questioned and all our equipment was confiscated. Eventually everything was returned to us, but we realized it was time to leave. It's okay. No, it's okay. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to Everybody, be careful, everybody. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> that was ridiculous. It's a little bit better. It's a little bit better. It was deliberate. It was deliberate. 